By the way, drinking game today, everybody. As many times this is Cameron's and Amelia's doing, as many times as you say pivot, you have to take a drink of something. I don't care if it's alcoholic or not, mine will be, so I'm in. <laughs> My water's empty, but I'll have another. Welcome to the Future's Edge podcast. I'm Jim Urio, and as usual, the brains behind the operation, actually I say that loosely this time because we're arguing about something we'll get to later, is Bob Iaccino, who's co-host and executive producer. We have senior advisor and head of client development at Exante Data, Amelia Bordeaux, and we also have chief investment officer at New Edge Wealth, Cameron Dawson. Thank you guys for coming. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So what I just was alluding to before is we've been, and this is not, this argument has been going on for weeks. I made a comment that I believed the Fed was going to pivot. And Bobby told me how stupid I was because the Fed's not going to go from hawkish to dovish anytime between August and September. I said, no, pivot doesn't mean necessarily that you go from hawkish to dovish. It can mean go, you can pivot from hawkish to neutral. Cameron, weigh in. Yeah, well, a pivot has been different each and every time the Fed has signaled some kind of change in its policy course. 2016, the pivot that really got markets going was that the Fed said we're not going to raise rates three times this year as they had initially signaled. 2018, there was, oh, wait, we didn't really mean balance sheet runoff was on autopilot. And maybe we'll consider dialing back on interest rate hikes later in 2019. It ended up being that they actually cut rates in 2019. So a pivot has been different each and every time. And I think we're sitting now in a position to say, is it is this enough for the liquidity environment to change? Is the Fed saying that once we get beyond neutral, we're going to reconsider the pace of hikes or or, or let, the, let us consider how the pace of hikes is impacting the economy? Is that enough to start making liquidity more abundant in the system? And that's where we're not so sure, because if you go back to 16 or you go back to 18, you actually saw markets respond where you started seeing um, um, kind of a relief in the tightening of liquidity that had happened going into those pivots. And the fact that the Fed is telling you that they still have quite a bit of tightening in the pipeline and that QT really hasn't hit markets yet and that it's only just going to kick into full gear in in September of this year we're not so sure that this constitutes you know the like the full dovishness that would support a market trading at very elevated valuations and and that's i think the last point in this is that you know we're sitting a little bit above 4100 as we record today you know on 2022 earnings that's about 18 times if we keep rallying from here, and, and I know some numbers like 4,800 were thrown out um, were thrown out today, if we rally to that level on 2023 earnings, we'll be trading at nearly 20 times earnings. And in this liquidity environment, with this amount of, of tightness that the Fed is still saying it's going to deliver, are we really comfortable paying that level for earnings? And does that effectively put a cap on how much this rally can go? Because we're really not seeing that sign that liquidity, like I said, is getting more abundant instead of getting more scarce. So are you saying Jim's right or Bob's right? That's all I was looking for. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I literally took that as me being right about it's no, not I a problem. Being right. I literally took it that way. I think <laughs> as traders, I just, got, I just got to say this real quick. And then I want Amelia to comment on the same question because literally as traders, which is mine and Jim's background, Amelia's as well. And uh, Cameron, I don't know if you have a, like a, an active trading background. I know you have an investing background, but from a perspective of trade, markets can only either go up or down. So people are like, oh, the market's sideways. Well, not really. Up one-tenth of a percent is up. Down five basis points is still down. So for Jimmy, like Jimmy's in a long trade, it turns around, it pivoted on him. And we're just in this mindset that it has to be one way or the other. We don't believe, yeah, I'm doing it too. We don't believe in gray. So- Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jimmy. No, um, Amelia, can you weigh in? And if you could just start with Jim's right and Bob's wrong and then continue after that, I mean, I could be happy on that. And by the way, at some point in time, and I do, I want to get back to Cameron on this too, 
because you know we've obviously had a bear market um, for the last six, seven months. What's the likelihood that's over? But Amelia, first, let's talk about has the has the Fed really pivoted? Is is the question? Have they pivoted to dovishness? Did what we saw on Wednesday was that monumental in markets, or am I being hyperbolic? I don't think the Fed or any of the major G10 central banks have pivoted. I think obviously the rates market has pivoted. So this rally in rates that we've seen uh, that's already been priced since mid-June, around June 14th is the peak in U.S. rates. Um, you know, they're, the market's pricing rate cuts for the U.S. Um, and other notable G10 economies for 2023. So the market certainly already priced the pivot. And that's kind of a little bit interesting because recently there's been better equity market sentiment on some of these earnings. Um, it's not clear we've seen in the, within the G10, you know, a peak in inflation in any of the G3 economies, say. And um, major central banks have surprised to the upside recently, like Bank of Canada, boom, 100 basis points, ECB, 50 basis points. So they've been surprising, you know, not the Fed was, we talked about 100, they went 75. And okay, so Powell was a little less hawkish than probably, you know, he could have been. But um, in terms of a trade, I mean, like, I, like, the market's already there, they've already priced the rate cuts. So, you know, it's interesting the speed at which they've priced the rate cuts from a hike to a cut. That's very interesting. So basically the market is saying, the market is convinced that the growth slowdown will be sufficient to bring down inflation and bring it down really quick. So I don't know if that's, I mean, that's the case, but you have to look at here, like, the trade, like what could really shock the market? Like what's gonna be the pain trade? What's gonna be a bad day or a good day? And that is gonna be, if growth stabilizes, that fixed income market is gonna rip the other way. And so that would, that's, you know, that I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm saying in terms of trading, I would think that that's what hedge funds are gonna pay attention to. So Cameron, uh, Cameron Amelia just mentioned some things about inflation and things about rates. And I've been arguing for seven straight weeks, we are in a declining rate environment. It was June 13th, June 14th. And since that time, we're declining. Since that time, the stock market has been more buoyant. Is everything in the stock market just dependent on rates? We're in tech week right now for tech earnings. Microsoft missed, yet they still rallied. Is that because of everything's being viewed in the prism of lower weights? That's for Cameron first. Yeah, I mean, certainly for growth stocks, right? So, so if we look at tech earnings this week, it wasn't necessarily that the earnings came in better than expected, but we got relief on the multiples. And that's where it really is about real rates that matters because we go back to Wednesday's meeting, the reaction in, in the bond markets was that you saw nominal rates come down, but you actually saw inflation rates move higher. It, it, you know, it, it priced in inflation in 10 year inflation move higher, slightly higher enough that you saw really sharp decline in real rates. Real rates are negatively correlated to the valuations on growth stocks, meaning that when real rates move higher, growth stock valuations move lower and the opposite. And as we've seen real rates move significantly higher this year, and again, remember, that's what the Fed wants. They told us at the beginning of the year, we want tighter financial conditions and we want higher real rates. So as real rates moved higher, what we saw was a lot of pressure on growth stock valuations. We actually didn't see earnings cuts for a lot of the growth companies. Um, they, they are still rather resilient and we didn't see really any cuts coming out of this quarter and even some names missed, but because the valuations had, you're now getting this relief because real rates are now moving over and they've rolled over pretty significantly. Uh, I think that's why we're seeing a rebound. Now, the question is, does the Fed want that. Is the Fed comfortable that since it stepped up its tightening to 75 basis points last June, they've done 150 basis points of hikes, and yet financial conditions have eased materially since then. Is the Fed comfortable with that? Because the Fed says, look, that's how we impact demand. We tighten financial conditions. They, the financial conditions being tighter will weigh on demand, which will eventually weigh on inflation. But if financial conditions are loosening, is it offsetting everything that the Fed's trying to do? You know, one last point in extrapolating too much from what the what bond market and the Fed is saying and pricing in, 
is that you could go back to December of 2021. The Fed had projected that it in the year of 2022, the Fed funds rate of 0.9%. The bond market had priced in using the WERP of a, a Fed funds rate ending the year at 0.8%. So this speaks to how data can change outcomes very quickly. And so now we're sitting at two and a half percent and we're actually at the same interest rate that the bond market and the Fed thought we'd get to at the end of 2024. Interesting. And and that and I love the fact that they dumped forward guidance too, just yeah. based on what you just said. Things can change quickly. Why in the hell would we have them saying what they're going to do a year from now? And they have no idea what they're going to do a month from now. Amelia, when you look at What we've seen this week, and we've talked about um, being in a declining rate environment. Do you think the bear market is over? You mentioned the words pain trade before. Is the pain trade in stocks to the upside? Um, I'm not an equity analyst. I wanted to defer to people, you know, to Cameron or someone who is an equity analyst. I've spent my whole (laughs) life in fixed income. By the way, on our podcast, you don't have to have an expertise in something to talk about. I know. I know. You know, I would say that... um, you know, I'm looking at global growth and U.S. growth, so I don't think we've, from that perspective, a consumer perspective, I don't know if we've bottomed yet in the cycle of U.S. growth. And so I, I feel like that would matter for equities. I feel like the the jobs, you know, we'll get jobs numbers next Friday. And so far, you know, Powell referenced this when they point blank asked him in the press conference, are we in recession, there's that buzzword. Um, Everyone's been debating all over social media this week. Um, And he said no. And one of the reasons he gave was because of the strength of the labor market. So we'll see next Friday. And I think, you know, we've got some wage data today, which is still pretty good. And, you know, that those higher wages are feeding into kind of second round effects for inflation. So it's it's an interesting time. I think um, the consumer will matter a lot here. So, so Amelia, though, you mentioned you mentioned jobs. And just to get to this, so we've seen a lot of headlines Ford, uh, some of the big tech companies shedding labor. Do right. you when we're, we got Friday, we have the unemployment number, which is the you know, used to be the crown jewel of, of the numbers. And now yeah. CPI is kind of taking the taking the headlines from it. Do you believe that we're about to see the next shoe drop in this either recession or not recession, whatever the hell we're in, depending on who you want to argue with? I don't think yet. I mean, I think there's certain sectors that are still tight and looking for labor. And I think there's certain sectors that obviously you mentioned tech, you know, that are laying off. I think that if consumers can retain jobs from here, you know, we can see consumption and, you know, when I mean consumption, I mean, you know, discretionary spending, say whether or not discretionary spending will continue to hold up. And I think that that's going to be important looking forward so we'll see so, so cameron we we t- the question i asked to amelia was mm-hmm. you know we've been in a bear market for seven months and it seems to me that it's been so so highly rate dependent is your gut telling you that the bear market's over and that uh, just one of the reasons i want to factor in the fact that we never saw the capitulation spike in the vix we never saw 50 yeah i was VIX. looking the vix has been quite low i mean given all yeah. the things that are sure. happening the vix is quite low Right. And Cameron, can you weigh on that? Yeah. So, you know, we, we'd been in the camp that we expected to see a lot more volatility and this volatility continue that we're still in a downtrend and it's unlikely that it's over. Now, the market action over the past few days definitely gets our attention or gets my attention in a meaningful way. And I, I kind of go back to periods where things felt really awful 2020 and in late March of 2020 and uh, in December 2018, March or February of 2016. And are, are we today still looking for data to get worse and missing the fact that the market is going to always price in a recovery before it happens and before we even see the data that's indicating that it's happening. Now, the funny thing about today's market is that not only has it, if if this continues, it would be pricing in a recovery before the downturn would even happen because <laughs> we haven't even seen a deterioration in data that's significant enough to suggest that 
we are actually in fact in a recession. Yes, we get the two quarters of negative GDP, but based on consumption and unemployment statistics, it really wouldn't be consistent with prior recessions where you typically see a, you know, a meaningful uptick in unemployment, meaningful job loss, as well as a hit to consumption, X transfer payments, right? Obviously in 2020, that was a little bit skewing the data. But so that, you know, that gets back to Amelia's point, which is that the data is going to be important because it will be an important indicator of how much our earnings numbers need to come down. And then it gets back to this notion of is the Fed um, pivoting in a way that is making liquidity more abundant? Because Drink, that's what, sorry, I did it. Sorry, you got to go. I'm in the middle of a thought. <laughs> but, you got it. But that's what, you know, that's what drives the multiples and multiples will always expand at the beginning of, of a, of a, of a bull market because the market gets it ahead. It's pricing in the recovery. Eventually it's just that we're missing in this scenario. We're actually missing the downturn because we haven't really priced in a downturn. Now, when I said what, get, what gets my attention over the last uh, few days of trading, I think there's a few important things that happened. The first one is is that if we look at, at uh, really risk on cyclical parts of the market, so you look at you know, uh, innovative tech, um, you look at the Russell 2000 small caps, these are names that are more liquidity sensitive, tend to be um, uh, more, more sensitive to risk appetite. Let's look at the Russell 2000. It bottomed versus the market in May. It's been actually performing better than the S&P 500, better than large caps since May. So when the market made a whole new low in June, small caps didn't confirm the low. They didn't make a new low. That's mildly bullish. The other part is that we saw a spike in 20-day highs yesterday. So coming out of the low, what you typically see is a big surge in 20-day highs. And the end result is that the board returns from that point. Once you cross over a certain threshold, it's about 55%. It gets your forward returns, your hit rate going, going into positive territory gets much, much higher. Now, that's just one data point. But I think that there have been some signs of improving cyclical appetite, improving risk taking, despite all the volatility under the surface. I'd say the caveat to all of this, because being a real two handed strategist, um, the caveat to all of this is that a lot of these areas remain in very distinct downtrends. So we can be having these little breaths and sighs of relief, but the downtrends are so entrenched, so in place, it really started late last year. That I think it's too early to call it over, um, but it certainly piques our attention to say some things under the surface are looking more bullish than they were even just a week ago. Bobby, do you want to come in on this and, and yeah, uh, bring it I to Amelia? So a couple of things I want to do, Amelia, I went back and watched uh, an interview of yours because I remember it from the time. Okay. You did an interview on TD Ameritrade in March of 2021. Okay. All right. And in that particular interview, it was uh, with Nicole Petalides. And you said that you didn't think international currency markets, especially, but equities as well, were prepared for what was going to happen with interest rates. And you talked about how economic data was still strong but you were starting to see inflation pressures. Now that obviously turned out to be absolutely correct. We've seen the Euro drop almost 18% since then. Equities though, rose like 21, 22% before they got the message. So when you're looking at it from the perspective of a 10 year that was at about 160, I'm guessing on that, I think it was around 160 at that time. And now we have it around 270. Everybody made a big deal that it fell below 3%, but it's still a full percent almost a percent and a quarter higher than it was then. Are markets priced in now, and I'm speaking almost exclusively to the Euro because I'm not smart enough to judge any other currency. Is the Euro gonna continue under pressure given what happened with say their inflation today, which beat their GDP beat? What's gonna happen with that market? Yeah, so the Euro zone is in a really um, difficult position right now. They're having um, an energy shock, an energy crisis, and there is no, um, outlook for that in terms of how 
exactly it will be resolved. So we are able to track at Exante data hourly gas streams from Russia through the Nord Stream pipeline. We look at this very closely. And um, they had a maintenance period in which they shut it off about a week ago. It came back online and that was the big day. Like I think it was July 21, whether or not these flows would be turned back on. They were turned back on. They're operating between 20 and 40% of normal. So Russia is obviously um, turning the screws on the Eurozone and they're making it difficult. Now, um, going forward, we don't, they hold the cards, right? Russia holds the cards. So we're not entirely sure how this is going to be resolved. And so this is quite a difficult situation for the Eurozone. Now the ECB just raised 50 basis points um, and that was stronger than more than the market had thought they'd Raise. They have not shifted their rhetoric. Um, they've been very hawkish on inflation. So they haven't shifted it to like any sort of growth worries or anything. Um, you know, the European Commission came out and has asked Europe to Eurozone to reduce consumption of gas by 15%. And so they haven't figured out exactly how, you know, they're going to do that. Um, but in 2023, it's a real guesswork as to what Russia will supply the Eurozone for gas. Um, the US, Denmark, Norway, Netherlands have stepped up to supply natural gas in 2023 too, um, you know, to the Eurozone, but depending on what, what Russia supplies, um, consuming, assuming there'll be a reduction, we don't really know how this is exactly going to shake out. So this is a really tough time for the Eurozone. So I would say, no, I mean, we had some rally in the Euro this past week because Nord Stream yeah. flows were turned back on. So we're above like 102, you know, we had been at parity. And I do think, unfortunately, for the Eurozone, it's a tough situation that it, the Euro will push lower, which means we haven't seen the highs yet um, in the dollar. So Amelia, a quick one for you. Do you see any pivot in domestic energy oh, policy? Jesus Christ. It's I'm out of drink. <laughs> pivot, oh, pivot. I said pivot. Jesus. Ugh. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, drink. Yeah, we're going to be hammered by the time this is over. Um, do you see any pivot in, in domestic energy policy that would lead us to believe that um, things are going to get better and we're going to become more reliant on our own energy and become inter energy independent again? It doesn't have to be a long answer. In the United States or in Europe? Yeah, United sure. States. They're certainly making, they're attempting to make that shift already in Europe, though these are difficult um, things to achieve. Um, the last point, wait, I'll get to you. The last point I should make about Europe is for Russia itself, um, you know, in terms of shutting off the pipeline, they they get a lot of money obviously from Europe. So it's not clear that they would, you know, do something even more devastating to their own economy than they've already done, but it's possible. To the US, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think domestically, um, obviously gas prices are still, they're coming down, at least here in Florida and nationally, I believe, but they're very, very high. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of disgruntled talk just among people about, you know, electric cars and how expensive they are. And they, so I do think there'll have to be a shift um, in energy policy, but I don't know in, in terms of the U.S. exactly how fast we would be able to, to make a shift here. What Cameron, you, oil could, prices, I'm sorry, Jimmy, uh, if I could. What are, you, what are you looking for domestic oh, oil Bobby. prices here? Oil. Uh, domestic oil prices? Yeah. Actually, I, ha I haven't looked since earlier. I don't know. So, no, have we put in the high for like the national average, you think, in crude? Or yeah. Oil? So, I looked yesterday. We were still 56% above a year ago yesterday. Okay. But we were down about 17% from the high. So, we were down. The, the average was still well above $4, but I think it was like okay. 4 0 uh, 431 or somewhere around there but it was interesting because the trumpeting of victory over high gas prices and and actually I'll, I'll pivot to a question to Cameron with this same subject I'm out um, from a perspective of inflation um, I'm going to read I, I wrote down a bunch of stuff this week because I knew I was talking to smart people uh, Nuriel Rubini said this week in an interview on Bloomberg uh, Dr. Doom as you all know Recession is not going to be mild and shallow. Anyone who thinks it is, is delusional. It's going to be severe and protracted. So if you're looking at CPI, which grew almost triple in the time frame that it shot up versus what it did the previous four years, explanation of that. Previous four years from about 2016, 2020, this is not a political statement. Inflation grew at about 9.1% over that four years. And then it grew at about 16% over the next, say, 26 months, okay? 
Now, CPI is an index, right? So if we get inflation down to 2%, it's still rising above its previous level. I think a lot of people forget that it's an index. So for example, gas prices, we're still above four bucks. That doesn't feel great for most people, even though we're not at five anymore. So Cameron, when we talk about the Fed pausing, not pivoting, but pausing, okay? When we talk about the Fed pausing, do you think maybe they got rid of forward guidance because they're tired of the market looking at the forward guidance and reacting however the fuck it wants to react? Well, I think they got rid of forward guidance because their estimates were so wrong and it backed them into a corner <laughs> to, to like deliver something. You just made something. Jimmy so happy. Right? <laughs> That's why it makes me so happy. I agree with that. <laughs> totally. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like, you know, it, it's it's not as if the forward guidance was that helpful. It just kind of caused them to be boxed into a bit of a corner. And in theory, it provides them more flexibility to to be able to respond to data as it comes out. Now, there's a few kind of rabbit holes to go down here. And I think, Bobby, maybe the first thing to address is this notion that price level does matter. CPI is a rate of change. We see the numbers and we either look at the year over year or the month over month number. But when, and you know, we talked about this at the last time you know, that we spoke that the Fed's big problem in calling inflation transitory is that the consumer doesn't understand second derivatives. That the second derivative of inflation can slow. Now it hasn't, right? Because we still are making these new highs in year over year readings but that the price level, even if inflation slows from 9.1% down to six, down to five and so on as we progress through the year, the price level really hasn't eased for consumers because you're still having that loss of purchasing power. And so yes, you might start to see things slow some on the rate of change of the price increases, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer then can rest easy. You know, think about house prices, for example. You know, I was looking at uh, like doing some research and seeing how house prices are reacting to this um, you know, tighter mortgage rates. And yes, some house prices are coming down. You see listings, you know, mostly in Florida, which is kind of a beta on everything. It swings. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Floridian native, so I'm, I'm allowed to talk about it. I am in Florida <laughs> right now. Just bought That's a house, right. so yeah, I'm going to talk my book. Yeah. So, so you know, they're down. They're down. Maybe 15 percent cuts have happened, but that's after 150 percent increases. And so you still have people that will be priced out of markets or that high gas prices, even if they stay at four percent, they won't be contributing to the month over month rate of acceleration in inflation. But they're still four four sorry four dollars in gas prices. They're still elevated. So you know, when you're getting back to this question of, of where inflation goes from here and how the Fed you know, will consider the, the success on inflation, you know, the challenge we have is that if you break apart the inflation data and even the PCE data today, um, I know we spoke about this a couple months ago, is that inflation is very broad and it's very sticky. So over, over 60 components of the PCE are over 4%. So the Fed can't look to, you know, one or two things, gas prices coming down or used car prices coming down as victory because so many of these things are moving higher. And then you have all these sticky components of the CPI like rent and overall shelter and other services that once they healthcare, go up- for, they, Healthcare is, is not going away. Yeah. So they go up, they stay up and they're unlikely to, they, they respond very slowly to tighter Fed uh, policy. And so- I think the challenge we have is that what does a world look like in um, where where inflation stays above the Fed's target of two percent on the PCE for some time because of these broadness and and sticky components, and what does that mean for the bond market? Because as I think Amelia pointed out, like the the bond market is pricing in a rapid return to two percent inflation next year, and it seems fairly confident about it. And so I think that's where you know maybe you know getting back to this question of where the pain trades could be, you know if inflation 
mutation does prove to be more persistent. And we're starting, and one last point, we're, we're getting into the point of tough comps now. The comps get tougher. And so base effects will be a headwind. So by definition, we should see inflation start to moderate because of that. But is that enough given how broad everything is and how sticky components are elevated? Uh, and, and will the bond market be proven right that inflation will, will you know, re return back to very low levels you know, quickly next year? I'm going to ask Amelia a question, but be prepared because when I come back to you, Cameron, I'm going to mention the fact that that several different times Jay Powell has pivoted right when it's very politically convenient. This time, this time, I'm as filling well. this I'll up. Here. I'll be right back. <laughs> but Amelia, here's for you. Today we saw personal income, personal savings, employment cost index. We saw a lot of things that I thought inflation was going to be rolling over. I thought high prices were going to be a cure for high prices. That doesn't seem to be happening. If wage isn't following, what, what has to happen for inflation to come down? I mean, who's going to buy these things if wages aren't keeping up? I mean, I think that global supply chain issues have to be resolved. And I think that those are slow um, moving pieces to be resolved. I think, you know, Cameron mentioned housing and I can speak from my own experience where I live in Florida. I live very close to the ocean near the beach and here there's a lack of inventory. So kind of, yeah, house prices might come down. They were overblown in Florida, but there's inventory difficulties in certain cities in, a, in the United States, some second cities where people might have moved and want to continue to move either in lower tax jurisdictions or uh, because they're allowed to, you know, remote work for various reasons now. And that could, you know, continue um, longer than people had initially expected, you know, right at the start of the pandemic. And so there, there's issues like that, that are certain pockets of kind of unusual activity. I mean, kind of what, is the cure we have to think for stagflation. And I think that we have to keep in mind that we're in really kind of unusual markets here of maybe all of us and a lot of people who actively trade in the market right now really haven't encountered stagflation perhaps in their active trading career. Um, so we have to see you know, how the market will react to that and how the people trading will react to that. Um, it, there's been a really weird time, obviously, with the pandemic the past three years where things have speeded up really quick, like plummets in the equity market, zoom, you know, things zooming back, like job loss and then coming back quick. And, and I'm wondering if that's how people are now pricing in, you know, this quick recovery, you know, or if, I mean, the bond market is pricing in this recover, I'll call it a recovery of inflation coming lower to, you know, back to target, back to 2%. And maybe that's not realistic for the stagflationary environment, which is to you know your point, Jim. So, um, so it's interesting how quick things have been pricing, and will that continue? And I actually think now it's hard to know. I'm just getting back to the housing market just real quick because we touched on it. Maybe it's not 2008, 2009. That's what people remember because they traded it and they were in that market. Maybe this market isn't that market. I don't know, but I'm just saying that there's things to look at um, that I feel like these markets are very un unusual right now. So, so to Cameron, we, we talked about supply chain there. And again, I know I thought it was gonna come back to political, but we all know really the answer to that question. So let's go to something else. We had Jim Bianco on this show and he talked about supply chain taking decades to heal itself. And he gave an example that was kind of almost chilling to me. He talked about TSA throughput and how travel, air travel is where it was in 2019. But um, pleasure travel was up like 130% and business travel was at like 50%. So we get back to air travel and there's 100 flights a day between New York and Chicago that nobody wants to be on. And there's very few between Chicago and San Diego and Chicago, Miami that the pleasure travelers do want to go on. So that's just one example of it. Cameron, are we seeing, what do you think? How is the supply chain going to heal? Is it, is it in the process now or is that a decades long process? You know, it's interesting. What's the one phrase that the Fed completely removed from its press statement uh, on Wednesday? It was that we, it was it was about supply green chain. Green shoots. What? Right. Wait, green shoots transitory. 
Green shoots, transitory. Oh, we're, so we're ignoring the supply chain. Is that what Jay Paul wants to know? Well, so so here, I mean, I think this raises an interesting problem because so we have seen things like freight rates come down pretty significantly, mostly ocean freight rates. And the second wave of lockdowns or third or whatever wave we're on in China of lockdowns actually has not resulted in the same kind of supply chain stress that we had in 2020 and 2021. It didn't compound on top of it. But you know, the reason why I brought up the, the Fed statement is that there, there is this notion, I think, in the Fed that inflation is not caused by us and not our problem. And I mean, it is their problem, right? Because that's why they do monetary policy. They have this, 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 this uh, mandate for price stability. But they look at the overall set, and that's kind of what led them to this transitory notion, right? Was that, look, these are all caused by the pandemic, and all we need is just a little bit of time for things to settle out. Now, they way underestimated how long it takes supply chains to heal, because supply chains are incredibly complex. And if anybody's ever played the beer game in college, have you ever the, the, the supply chain management and or, or in business school, move the beer, and what you see is like these big bullwhip effects within inventories uh, that take a long, time to be able to heal but the fed you know in, in you sure in, you were in business school and weren't at a fraternity party or something when this <laughs> lesson was taught Move you just think about that. there you go on <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, we might have actually replayed the game later later in the day. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, it's summer Friday, yeah. everyone. You know, we can yeah, yeah. Bobby's two glasses of bourbon in, so we're yeah, we're fine. <laughs> I think but the Cameron, only reason I cut you off before you finish. Yeah, uh, sorry, well, I so just worked at a major investment bank. We're on some. This was a while ago. Obviously, they had a drink cart come around the training floor on Friday. Yeah. What's going to happen? By the way, I'll name my my place. Nico Securities out of Japan. They did the same thing. Sushi and drinks starting at like two o'clock on a Friday. This awesome. rolled rolled it around. That was in the days of the Kiratsu where they all like stole from each other. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cameron, you were saying. <laughs> Well, I was going to I, I was going to bring up Arthur Burns because you know, we we think about the the Fed's policy in the 1970s and there was a similar notion of not caused by us but we have we can do something to take care of it but not caused by us Ex external factors right you had uh, OPEC oil embargo and and the great grain robbery and yeah we had a big depreciation of the dollar because the of the of the removal of the of the gold standard but not really our problem you kept seeing you know they would keep writing off they kept would change the statistics say oh well let's remove women's clothes because there was some kind of supply chain issue let's not include that in the statistics but what's relevant here is when we're thinking about the fed pivot uh how comfortable there it is. How comfortable is I am the Fed? Loaded right now. I just want you guys to know. <laughs> As inflation starts to come down, you know, if they were to pivot, does that restoke inflation? Come on, inflation? now you're doing it on purpose. Sorry, sorry. Bobby's going to be hammered. Bobby's going to fall <laughs> down. Do, does well, that cause? Thing. Like, how is the Fed? You're right, Cameron. I mean, like, how is the Fed going to calibrate this? It's, it's a tricky thing to calibrate, right? So, what happened in 1974 and 1975 is that inflation spikes and the Fed raises interest rates. And then unemployment spikes and growth slows materially and the Fed cuts interest rates. And then inflation spikes and the Fed raises interest rates again. And if you look at the chart of the Fed funds rate over, you know, over the that short period of time in the early 70s, I mean, it looks like uh, an EKG. It's just all over the place. And it was called stop go policy. And so, you know, not to say that we have the same setup in, um, uh, you know, in in the economy today. You have much less wage power or labor power. You know, the percentage of people in unions is smaller. Um, you have much more energy intensity in the economy in the 1970s, but I think it's important to think about if the Fed does pivot, does that breathe new life into these inflationary dynamics? And it really rests on the question of how much of this inflation was caused by the Fed's interest rate policy and ultra easy policy 
versus what was completely exert external exogenous factors outside of their control with them having nothing to do with it. And that question, I think, will come up in February and March of next year when bond markets pricing in that the Fed's going to cut interest rates. And that's when we'll be going, yeah, but doesn't that make inflation worse if it's still above their target? So, um, Amelia, I, I love that answer, by the way. And we've talked a couple of people, and I think you mentioned this once too, the Fed seems to think that by lowering demand, somehow that's going to help heal supply chains. And in my mind, it seems like demand being high and you know the supply chain then figures itself out with animal spirits and people wanting to make money and trying to figure out the way to supply things for the people that need it. But Amelia, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that am I right about that? Shouldn't demand be high if we want to heal supply chain? Um, I well, I would think like they want to. Maybe they're thinking about it in terms of easing the pressure on the supply chain. So uh, you know, like supply chains. It's, it's okay, that's a great answer. By the way, I didn't so, even think of that. Yeah, you know, like if they're bringing demand down, then there's not as much demand for good. I mean, right? What happened in the um, in the pandemic was people couldn't obviously go anywhere. There was lockdowns, and then you know there was like there was no international air travel. I was on one of the first flights to Italy. When that was June 2021, that was the first time since they shut down that they let Americans into, um, I had to fly JFK Rome. That was the only way you could fly into, you couldn't even fly from any other airport in the United States. I think Atlanta and JFK were the only airports allowed to enter Italy, um, flight from those. So, I mean, you couldn't go anywhere, even if you wanted to. So, um, you know, what do people do? They bought goods, right? They, they bought Peloton, they bought, and now people like are easing away from goods and they're buying services, assumingly, because everything's open now, you can go pretty much wherever you want, you can travel. I mean, just the amount of travel I saw to like Europe this summer from the United States was crazy. Everybody was, you know, finally able to go on those big vacations. Um, because some people um, didn't have fully vaccinated, were fully vaccinated last summer. It was like hot vac summer last year, and now it's like hot travel summer like this year. So, you know, that some of that spending has shifted from goods and cert to services, which is why probably I'm assuming ahead goods prices will come lower in the United States, but services prices will remain a bit sticky because even if things are expensive, if consumers re retain their job, they're probably kind of like, well, we're just going to live, we live once, we're going to go out and do this, who knows, you know, you're kind of, they kind of have that pent up services demand that's an overhang from the last, you know, two to three years. And so I think that services yeah. prices will remain sticky. I think that wages could remain sticky. And then as Cameron noted, they go second round effect into inflation. It, it largely depends on, you know, the labor market. So I would think that the Fed okay. is tightening to quell the labor market to quell demand, you know, kind of. No, I like it. And I like what you said about taking pressure off the supply chain was a point that I hadn't um, really considered before. But but Cameron, to my point, it is a mixed bag, though, right? I mean, if we lower demand too much, it takes away some of the incentive to high to uh, heal some you know specific parts of the chain, correct? Yeah, I will look at this in in the context of the commodity market. So the, the seeds of every boom or tight market are sown in the prior down cycle. The reason we have such tight commodity markets today is because we haven't been investing since the peak of the last commodity super cycle, which really peaked in 2014, which also coincided with a with a new, you know the 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 trough in the dollar at that time. And so when we think about supply chains in those in hard commodities, you know the challenge you have is that you haven't been investing in people, you haven't been investing in equipment, you've really just been running as efficiently as you possibly can because prices were not high enough to incentivize any kind of investment, be it greenfield investment in a brand new facility, whether it's a copper mine or an oil well, or brownfield investment in just an expansion. You can also see that in, in you know, some of the tightness we see in the gas markets today and, and gasoline markets in the US. Your refineries are running all out. They're running as much as they can because we haven't built a new refinery in the US in decades. And so because there, there hasn't been an incentive to, to build it, and, and that incentive has waned even more because of the push to ESG, the lack of ability to get funding for some of these projects, 
as well as the uncertainty about the green transition. You know, if you're talking about a project that will, you know, will be profitable if, if it, if you can see a 30 year view, but everybody's telling you in 15 years, you're not going to be able to allow to use that product, then why would you make that investment? And so, you know, in, in some ways, um, if you see weaker demand and it deters investment, it can actually prolong what are structural issues within a within an economy or within a, a specific supply chain. Now, on consumer goods, I would agree that that if you see a little bit weaker demand, you should start seeing things become a little bit more fluid. That's what the railroads will talk about, which is that when they get overloaded with volume, fluidity absolutely seizes up. And so when volumes come back a bit, that's when they can kind of move and groove. You actually start seeing margins in those businesses get better because they're just able to run at, at much more efficient levels. Now, we already are seeing that peak in goods prices, in durable goods prices. So they actually peaked on a year over year basis at nearly 20% in January of this year. They have now rolled over in their in the, the degree of expansion on a year over year basis to about eight or nine percent year over year. So because of this shift from goods to services, big ticket items, people no longer needing to buy another grill because they bought one last year, they already refurnished their homes, all these things, you're starting to see that demand slow down. And that demand slowing down is resulting in lower price increases. And eventually it could even result in lower prices. Because if we go back pre-pandemic, durable goods prices, inflation was non-existent. And actually we had multiple periods of durable goods deflation because of globalization. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely that once we get past this, this period where we pull for demand and we have supply chain issues, uh, that, that you'll see durable goods prices really stabilize and could even fall. One last point, Durable goods demand is probably one of the reasons why supply chains did get so glommed up. Um, much easier to move a piece of fruit than it is to move a bicycle. And so as we saw a lot of demand for big ticket items through the pandemic, that caused a lot of disruptions within supply chains that weren't, you know, weren't used to moving those types of things. Um, and so as those start to fade and you see a little bit more of essentials demand, non-durable goods, maybe that can help on the supply chain front as well. Fascinating. I love that answer. Bobby, what do you got? We got about 10 minutes left. Um, I think we could do two hours of this, but I want to hit you both with something that Steph Pomboy said. Um, she's the CEO and founder of Macro Maven. She's actually going to be on the podcast in September. <clears throat> but she said after the Fed decision, by the time employment is slackening to the degree the Fed wants, we will be in 2008 all over again. So um, let's go, Cameron, then Amelia, on that particular comment. I read that to mean that people don't believe that the Fed's number one issue right now is inflation, that the market doesn't believe it. And I personally believe that it is. We talk, we've talked on this podcast before, Jimmy and I are constantly saying how the Fed is politicized. And, but I think they care less about asset prices this time. And I think that's what Steph is saying. Um, I'm going to repeat it. By the time employment is slackening to the degree the Fed wants, we will be in 2008 all over again. Uh, Cameron, what do you think about that statement? And then Amelia, after that, please. Yeah, so you know, this it, it, it harkens back as well to the Rubini statement about a very long, protracted kind of recession, and it seems I clearly that, follow a lot of like grim people. I just I I'm drawn to that somehow. Yeah, you need a little sunshine in your life. Um, um not There's that I'm not gonna now, get Bobby. it, Come on, yeah, I'm not gonna get it from Jimmy. I just gotta walk outside, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, look, I I I'm. I'm hesitant to make the comparison to 2008 simply because if we look at corporate and consumer balance sheets, they are nowhere near as levered or as in precarious of a position as they were in 08. Um, and that's what causes a protracted recession and downturn is a debt crisis. There's a big difference between the, the corrections we had pre-1990, so post-World War II to pre-1990, Recessions were caused by inflation and the Fed's reaction to inflation. Tighten monetary policy, reduce demand, have a recession. 1990, starting with the savings and loan crisis, going into the, um, the tech bubble bursting, which really was a money market crisis. It was a crisis of people funding short or borrowing short to fund long. 
essentially what Enron did or what a lot of these, these um, companies that were accounting scandals did. Oh, wait, of course, we had the mortgage crisis. These were all debt crises that ended up causing very protracted market downturns, and some had more protracted economic effects than others. But we don't really see that set up today. The areas where we have issues with debt don't really have that kind of same flavor of contagion. Um, you know, yes, there's issues in venture capital. Yes, there's in issues in crypto, but they haven't spread to the rest of the market. So to have a protracted recession, we think you'd either need to see some kind of corporate debt crisis, but corporate balance sheets look pretty okay. Most companies that were good companies really termed out their debt and, and locked in very low interest rates. Um, there has been a push of, of, of non-public market funding into the shadow banking industry, a lot harder to measure, but that's probably something that we should watch closely. But then when we think about the consumer balance sheet, consumer credit use has gone up significantly this year to bridge the gap between what people want and what they can afford. But consumer balance sheets overall are still in some of the healthiest positions they've been in since the 1950s. If we look at the debt service ratio to the or li asset to liability ratio. So what this says is that that we can see a period of somewhat weaker demand, but we have to we don't have to go through a period of massive economy wide debt restructuring. And that's what causes an 08. That's what causes a protracted recession. Um, and one last point just on housing is that there's a lot of notion, oh, interest rate rates are going to go up and you're going to see this big housing crisis. Well, the percentage of people that have adjustable rate mortgages is significantly lower. It's only about six, seven percent today compared to over 30 percent going into the great financial crisis, meaning that interest rates go up. People today are less likely to get priced out of their existing home. They're less likely to have foreclosures on their existing home because they've locked in a mortgage. Now, some people will, people who have arms, they, they, they will have issues. But again, we don't have that same kind of debt crisis where people are exposed to floating rates and exposed to short-term funding rates like we had in prior crises. Okay, so I want to I want to modify the question for Amelia. I'm going to read this again, Amelia. Step palm boy. By the time the employment is slackening to the degree the Fed wants, we will be in 2008 all over again. Now, Cameron, Amelia mentioned uh, Nouriel Roubini again. Nouriel Roubini actually said that debt ratios are historically high. So because Cameron's right about the consumer debt ratios, I looked at the detail of it, and he's talking about. Uh, global economies, which is kind of something I think it's more what you guys look at because debt ratios for global economies are 420%. So do you, <laughs> Cameron wants to address that. So I'm, but but just, I want to go to- Just that, that we shouldn't, like we, we need to consider, we need to consider, a, make a very big difference between sovereign yeah. debt yeah. and it, because sovereigns can print money yeah. It, it, so, 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 you know, it, it mostly if you're a reserve currency. So, so, you know, that like blending the two of them together, a hundred percent. Yes, yes, they are elevated. But it's it's a very different question when we're thinking about debt crises. Now, sovereign debt crises can happen if you don't have control over your currency, aka Greece, right? But yeah. if you have control over your currency, then a sovereign debt crisis, you might have some inflation issues. So you but, almost jumped through the screen to address sorry, that. Sorry. So, well, because no, that, it's okay. It's okay. I, I don't this like it when I they're like conflated. About you but, know, like, I'm, I think that just getting back to my point, I kind of spoke to it earlier. I don't like comparing now to another time necessarily, because I think we're I think it's it's a very unusual market conditions and markets are behaving unusually. And I kind of think like we should accept that for what it is. And we're probably in a different trading paradigm, at least in terms of approaching this than we were in the past. People like to look at 2008 because that was kind of the most recent shock. Um, and they like to compare this to that. I don't like to, because I, as I said, this is, this is a different time. Um, I think in terms of the housing market now in 2008, obviously what Cameron mentioned, the um, adjustable rate mortgages are, are low. I mean, that's more of an issue for like a Canada or a United Kingdom, you know, that are aggressively hiking rates and they have a shorter mortgage curve, you know, they lend at like the two to five year sector as opposed to the 30 year sector, which are the majority of, of US mortgages, um, you know. So a lot of people are protected in the sense that they locked at the back into the curve when it was a lot lower in the United States. That's great. Um, we also don't have the excess inventory, I don't believe, that we had in 
2008, we have inventory shortages and a lot of housing pockets of how major housing uh, regions in the United States, there's still an inventory shortage. Um, that's different. Um, you know, in terms of like sovereign debt crises, um, obviously the ECB just introduced uh, the TPI. I yeah, don't think that is because every time like I say TPI, I, mean, I think like CPI, which I mean they're obviously like two completely different things. But I think the, the transmission TPS reports from August instrument. from office space. Remember the TPS reports from the office <laughs> TPS because they're the total pieces of shit. That's why they got. That's why the uh, yeah. That's why they were called that. in office go ahead, space. Amelia. Please explain that because very confusing the TPI CPI linguistics of it. But um, in any event, the the ECB did that. It, it you know I don't know if it could ever if it could be triggered, but we're looking at Italy. Italy. Um, Mario Draghi, my my favorite, he um, resigned recently. So they have a caretaker government. So we're looking at kind of, you know, a little bit of difficulty here in Italy with perhaps some sovereign debt. And the TPI is, is in place to, as the ECB hikes, it, the, the periphery gets kind of um, it, it, like disproportionately impacted, let's put it that way, because of their large debt. And so the TPI is there to kind of um, mitigate that should they need it. So they kind of have something in place, you know, as opposed to 2008, they've been through that already. Um, saying that, I mean, I think almost anything can happen. But I mean, like who knew about the pandemic and who knew, you know, like it's just kind of nuts what we've seen. We've seen governments turn over now right in the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, and they're coming up to choose, it's not a general election, but the, the conservatives will choose a new leader soon. You know, Italy is heading towards election in September. We have the US midterms in November. Um, you know, a lot of things are happening on the on the political front too that we can't necessarily anticipate. Um, that. Jimmy, yeah, you know what I don't I like about Amelia? There's one thing I don't like about Amelia. Mm -hmm. She's so damn reasonable. It drives me crazy. Jimmy, no, will, Jimmy will vouch for me on this. Being Italian and being smart is Freaking impossible because the two things clash <laughs> constantly. There's no reasonableness no, in our culture. I have something. This is important. Cameron, to you, you mentioned the adjustable rate mortgages, but you didn't mention in our comparisons to 2008, the, the level of homes that were primary residents versus investment properties where everybody's brother-in-law who was an electrician had five different houses that he was rehabbing in 2007 because he was going to be the next Sam Zell. Um, that's an important part of this, right? Not just the adjustable rate, but the, we never saw that huge buildup, right? Yeah, I mean, some of the the price weakness that we're seeing in different pockets of the of the housing market within the U.S. is clearly related to people not wanting to buy second homes, right? Because that's where you know, if you're looking to buy your first home, maybe you know, maybe you're willing to stretch your budget a little bit more, and then second home, you're like, oh, I'll just be patient. Uh, so. Clearly, there's some. There was some second home purchases, of course, and that's why we saw such big booms in different kind of vacation kind of spots. So there was some of that, but the house flipping, I think, was starting to happen. And this, you know, this gets us back to how much the Fed actually had an impact on the inflation, because I would argue that uh, that there were quite a few drivers of inflation within the economy, different pockets of inflationary forces that were tied to the housing market. And the housing market was able to boom because the Fed kept the rate on mortgages so incredibly low. So people could afford to pay up. They could afford to, um, to invest in their homes because of the very, very low mortgage rates, which is why you saw this, you know, when you saw things like the, the average house price to income spike to new all-time highs because the mortgage servicing uh, uh, part of that on the interest rate actually remained rather muted. And so I think the Fed certainly contributed to inflation. I think we can draw a very direct line in that scenario. Now, the other good things and differences is that credit quality is far better uh, for most homeowners today than it was going into to 07, 08. We didn't see that same kind of really drop down in, in credit quality in order to just 
get people into houses. Uh, you, you didn't have those no down payment mortgages. No, what's interesting, those started, those started um, popping up in Germany. So you started seeing zero down payment mortgages over the past couple of years with interest rates being so low and the economy recovering. And you know, you, I think to Amelia's point, maybe the US is okay in its housing market because we've, we've healed, but there could be other parts of, of the developed world that have far more mm. challenges as interest rates move up. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? I'm talking my experience again, not my market experience. My personal experience, I bought September 16, 2008 in New York City. Okay, that was the day after Lehman went under. I closed in on a property in New York City. <laughs> oh, and, um, and I just bought, I closed on a property March um, this year, 2022. And I will say that the mortgage process, those two times were completely different. It was so much easier in 2008. I was just, it was like, la la la, walking apart compared to now in 2002. And people, and I hadn't, I hadn't bought since then. And people were like laughing at me. They were like, what did you expect to? Like, I couldn't believe how, thir- like, I don't know. I know that sounds terrible. I couldn't believe how thorough they were and how long this closing took and then it it went through but it was just like you're kidding me right back in 08 when I did this like it was so much faster so much easier and so I think it speaks to you know just what Cameron mentioned it was a lot more diligent to who they lend to and how much they lend to everything now than it was back then so you you just talked about timing real quick and just we're we're gonna get going soon too there's gonna be one more short answer question too but a quick story my wife made partner in her law firm uh, in about 2006 or maybe 2005 and they gave her a third of the mortgage of the office building and the uh you know the, uh, the third of the equity there was no equity it was just a mortgage but it, the, the price of the office building went up like 25 percent in the next year and then it needed a new roof and my wife and her partners they all looked at her like she got some sort of gift because at the time she was made partner the property went up so much so my wife in her infinite wisdom and her partners decided that we should pay for the new roof just because that we got like a you know one hundred fifty thousand dollar gift in the appreciation of the of the property, so we put in the ro- the roof. I pay fifteen grand, and within the next like four months, the bottom just absolutely falls out, and the building is worth half what it was before. So this people don't un- they didn't understand risk when it slaps them in the face. It's just amazing to me. But Cameron, back to to you. We mentioned the political aspect of the Fed. I want this to be a short answer: zero to ten. How motivated is the Fed? by politics how much is their recent um movement about the november elections in your opinion and please be brutal it's friday afternoon um, i don't i don't know i mean we like i think the only one thing that was clear is that that that, that pal wanted the job that i mean that's yeah, the one that's what i'm motivation. saying like pal wanted that's the job awesome that's but, fantastic but he got he he got re he got renominated and his term is for another two years. So does he care one way or the other? I mean, I'm sure he would want to retire. I think he would retire after that. You made that, it sound so. rhetorical. Let's pretend. He looked, didn't he look rhetorical. tired at that yes. press conference? Didn't he look like he'd been through the ringer? Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the oh, Amelia, to you. Ever. Amelia, to you. Well, you know, I'm biased here because I'm a I'm a Fetty. So my first job was the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. Um, that's where I started my career in the international division there. So I have a soft are you are you uh, filibustering? Are saying, you talking this so you don't have no, to answer the I'm question? No, I'm just saying that <laughs> the Fed is apolitical and they do the right thing for the economy. And I know they a missed the whole transitory thing. That was a big miss. That was really unfortunate. But you um, can no longer be there. trusted big mess up but uh i like to think that they uh do the right thing i don't know what they do to you guys i mean i have a friend that worked at the new york fed and the guy is just constantly angry about politics and everything i'm like i think the fed is politicized no they are absolutely <laughs> and they don't do anything wrong how He's dare you right even suggest like that. that hey jimmy i know we have to go but i just wanted to ask cameron one more thing because uh, cameron i'm so grateful that you send this research uh, piece to me every time you write it. And on page 13, um, you talked about policy isn't that tight yet. Now, I know this, you're probably working on another piece now because you're a lunatic with work. But um, can you explain that a little bit? Because I think people think, you know, they're already pricing in the pause, not the pivot, but the pause. 
I think they're already pricing that in, but you <laughs> you already talked about in your in your uh, note, which is 32 pages long, so it's not a note, um, how the balance sheet really hasn't moved much. Yeah, it's still expanding 9% year over year. And so- wow. You in that and Powell mentioned that in the press conference, you know, yes, we've done we've started QT, but really because of the timing of certain things, how they work through the system, um, we really won't feel it until until September. And so from a balance sheet perspective, the Fed, you got to a point in 2018 where the balance sheet was contracting 10 percent year over year uh, during that quantitative tightening. So you know, yes, we started the QT, but it's not as if we've really gotten to a point where everything is so tight that they're really like sucking liquidity out of the system from a QT perspective. I think that you can look a at a lot of liquidity metrics, look at money markets, look at the use of the, of the, um, of, you know, some of the, the liquidity. Well, what am I thinking of? What's the, what's the one that, that sugar? M2? <laughs> No, no, not the dollar swap lines. You can um, say shit. It's okay. <laughs> I want. Plus, I think it's we should stop everything when Cameron becomes tongue tied and forgets what she's saying. It happens so infrequently that I think we should stop and ridicule it because we're only going to get this one. There it is. Ever. Oh man, the reverse oh, repo. Of course, yeah, we should put <sighs> that in. Yeah. Next time, the yeah. the drinking game has to be with the reverse repo. <laughs> right. Yeah. But the the point the point is that you know, the Fed has just gotten to neutral. The balance sheet's still expanding nine percent. M two money supply is still growing at at seven percent. Now the Fed doesn't control the money supply. Completely. Completely. It has some impact on it. It also has to do with bank lending. But if we go back to the period prior to the, the pandemic, money supply growth, M2 growth was, you know, it ranged in a range of like four to eight percent. So we're still at the high end of money supply expansion uh, going back to in the prior cycle. So that's why I would say is that okay, I get it. The Fed's raised rates and the two year has responded and we priced in these rate increases. And But then you step back and go, yeah, but are we all that tight from these big high surface level you know, views? And yes, there are certainly pockets where liquidity has become constrained and that there is stress in the system. But I just don't know if the stress in the system is bad enough yet to get the Fed to act. Okay. Reverse repo, like a just. <laughs> oh sugar. <laughs> oh sugar. <laughs> I'm gonna say oh sugar from now on, just as a uh, oh as like an homage to my friend Cameron. I'm <laughs> I'm not gonna ask any more questions or answer any more questions. I want to leave now and go to the bar. Does anyone object to that? You should pivot right. from where you're at. And I'm go pivoting to the bar. from where we are now, and I'm pivoting to a Tito's and soda. Uh, Cameron, tell them where they can find you on Twitter. It's just Cameron Dawson at Cameron Dawson. That's awesome. And you don't, what your research is proprietary. You don't put that out for general public consumption, right? If you ask nicely enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. And I love it. I don't read it as closely as Bobby does. And thank you so much. It's because you guys yeah. have asked nicely. <laughs> you are the best. And Amelia, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter at Amelia Bordeaux, so B-O-U-R-D-E-A-U, -E and they can find some of our public-facing work from ex -ante data at, at, at ex -ante data on Twitter. You want to follow that as well. Yeah, it's also a great follow, by the way, and, and Amelia, we're talking to one person who left Florida and one who's not coming. I don't even want to talk to them anymore. <laughs> I'm coming sometime. I was just looking at property today. It's, I'm just waiting for it to start to come back down. I'm going to buy something soon. Uh, maybe Fort Myers uh, Beach area, maybe Key Largo. Yeah. I don't know. We shall see. Nice. But uh, one thing we, one thing we do on this show is like it's always like when you're 15 year old talking to your girlfriend. Nobody knows how to leave a Zoom call. It's like no, you hang up. No, you hang up. So I'm always the first to hang up. Bye. Wait, the first thing I want, I want feedback We're on the Google case no. store. So I, if anyone wants to leave that in the comments, please tell me. Say that it's again. Not mine. It's from the previous homeowners. Do I keep this or leave it? I, I can't tell. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I hate it. Is it oh, a that's sticker? A great call. No, it's painted on. It's a. It's a. It's a, actually. I have a closet and a bathroom. There's two of them. You can't see the other one. And it's painted. It's hand painted. And I feel bad painting over it, but I'm like, it is kind of weird. But I. That's such that's a crazy. Thing. I was going to ask you what the books were like. That it's looks like so a faux. Weird. 
It's a Florida thing. In, in like the mid 90s through the mid 2000s, murals were all the rage. Oh. So you walked into any Florida house and they had this big mural. It's weird. Where the kid was like, like the proprietor's a tacky. Keep it or toss it. Keep it or paint it. Keep it or paint it. Don't, paint you, it. don't you make fun of my adopted state. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we gotta get together, Bobby. Where Thanks are you again, guys. Right? I where really, you, really appreciate it. Are you located in? I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I'll be yeah. up in New York and I'll be up in New York in September and frequently. So well, let me know. I'm here. Yeah, we'll grab a drink. Yes. Awesome. Thank Cheers, you. guys. Bye. Thank you so Bye, much, guys. both of you. I appreciate it. Of course.